Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. I want to start by welcoming you and thanking you for coming to the North Seattle College Gallery's 13th lecture in our Visiting Artist Lecture Series. I'm Amanda Knowles, the coordinator of the NSC Art Gallery, and I teach printmaking and drawing in the art department at North Seattle College. I'm pleased to work with Karen Zeldreyer, who assists in the gallery. We have a live transcript available for those of you who want it, those of you who don't want it and or find it distracting. Uh, you can turn it off by clicking the button at the bottom of your screen and selecting hide subtitle that would be under live transcript. Use it if you wish, hide it if you wish, but we wanna make sure that we have it for those who need it. As we're not currently putting up shows in the art gallery, we are so pleased to be able to find ways to interact with artists and continue to have them come to talk with us and show us what they're doing and working on. Today is the third lecture in the spring quarter lecture series. And uh, we'll continue through the quarter with lectures every other week. The next lecture will be an art alumni panel. I urge you to visit our website to see the list of upcoming visiting artists and for links to recordings of those who have spoken to date. Uh, we'll put the links in the chat and we have once they'll come back, back up again uh, in a bit. We'll uh, begin this lecture with some acknowledgements. Okay, first is our land acknowledgement. On behalf of North Seattle College, we acknowledge that we occupy the traditional ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Duwamish tribe, a people that are still here, continuing to honor and bring to light their ancient heritage. Without them, we would not have access to this gathering, dialogue, and learning space. We ask that we take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are definitely still here. Thank you. Um, and then we have a labor acknowledgement. We also pause to recognize and acknowledge the labor that created the United States and from which we all benefit. We remember that our nation is built on the labor of enslaved people who were forcibly brought to the US from the African continent. And we recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. We acknowledge immigrant labor and recognize that voluntary forced and prison labor contribute to the building and maintenance of our nation. We acknowledge all unpaid caregiving labor. Additionally, we acknowledge the critical importance of uprisings for racial equity that continue across this country in response to racial injustice and generations of structural racism against BIPOC communities. And the third slide, um, this next slide is uh, what we are doing as we continue to work to go from acknowledgement to deed. It is not enough to just acknowledge the land and labor. We have to be sure that we are taking action. We show you here the, uh, what the actions of the art department and our institution are and what we're doing to, to support BIPOC individuals and institutions and to be held accountable. We recommend Real Rent Duwamish and we'll put that link in the chat for you to explore. Thank you. So now I get to introduce our visiting artists. The North Seattle College Art Gallery has partnered with the North Seattle College Social and Multicultural Events Board to host today's Visiting Artist Lecture. It is my pleasure to introduce you to today's visiting artist, Humaira Abid. Humaira was born and raised in Lahore, Pakistan. She immigrated to the United States in 2008 and now lives and works in Seattle. Abid received her BFA in sculpture and miniature painting from the National College of Arts in Lahore, Pakistan. Her works have been exhibited in museums and galleries and documented in publications around the world and reviewed by local, national, and international news media. Her exhibition, Searching for Home, was shown at the Bellevue Art Museum in 2017-18 and at the Center for Art in Wood in Philadelphia in 2020. Humera is the recipient of numerous honors, including the 2019 Artist Trust Arts Innovator Award, the Bob Stocksdale International Excellence in Wood Award, as well as other prestigious awards and grants. Her work has been published in books and other print media. She has lectured widely and participated in residencies and symposia around the world. Humera was an artist in residence at uh, Facebook Bellevue in 2019, creating artwork for their campus. Two documentary features focused on Abid and her work produced by the KCTS 
nine branch of PBS and the Seattle Channel were both nominated for Northwest Emmy Awards. Kumara is represented by Greg Kucera Gallery here in Seattle, where last year she mounted a beautiful exhibition entitled Sacred Games. She currently has work up in a group exhibition at the Tacoma Art Museum entitled Immigrant Artists and the American West. She also has work in the group show entitled Breathe at the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art, which is up until mid-June. I will be handing you over to Humera, but before I do, I want to, to let the audience know that we will be taking questions from the chat today. Uh, when submitting questions, please direct them directly to me. So if questions or comments arise during the talk, please write them in the chat and we will hopefully get to each and every one of them. Uh, we will be sending a transcript of the chat to Humera after the talk. So if you want to comment on the work and her words, please do. You might be specific about what you're commenting on as Humera will be uh, seeing it separate from her talk. Um, and thank you so much for coming to speak with us, Humera, and welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited to share my story and my work with all of you. Um, as you just gave my introduction, very kind introduction, thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, that I'm born and raised in Pakistan. So yes, I was born and raised in Pakistan. Um, I am the youngest in my family. So uh, my brothers were like another set of parents for me. So when I was growing up, um, you know, in South Asia, especially if kids are good in studies, their parents want them to be either engineers or doctors. So my family wanted me to be a doctor and I can't even see blood. If I, I see blood, I actually pass out. So I actually tried pre-medical for uh, just to please my family. I couldn't do it. So I remember having a conversation with my father that art is something I would like to pursue and I just cannot do medical. And, um, and they were not happy about that, but uh, that was the, and I told them that I have to go to art school and it was very difficult for them. Art was not considered a profession at that time, more like a hobby. So um, and they did not want me to go to art school. And uh, art was something that spoke to me that was coming out of my heart. Even when I was doing, uh, studying pre-medical, I was most interested in um, sketching uh, the diagrams more than you know anything else. I'm going to start the screen share also. So as I speak, I can show you some images. And when I decided to go to art school and uh, we have a very prestigious art school, National College of Arts. And I remember um, when I got admission, which was challenging, uh, it became real to my family. And um, they did not want me to go, go to art school. Art schools were considered a place where students get too much freedom. It was not something encouraged by families, especially for girls. Um, I remember when I decided to go to art school, I told my family that was the first time I took a stand and for something. And I said, I'm just going to art school no matter what. And my brothers who were like another set of parents for me, I remember my brother came to me and gave me all sort of warnings not to wear sleeveless, do not smoke, uh, because that's what their impression was happens at art school. Um, I said, no matter what, I'm going to art school. I went to art school, I got scholarship all four years and I uh, graduated with honors. I was called back as a faculty member right away. Um, because of which I later on ended up becoming the youngest assistant professor in, at that time in, in school. And after a few years, I was able to establish myself. And I remember after a few years, uh, one day my father said in front of the whole family that it was the right decision and he's very proud of me. It's one of the best moments in my life. And just to tell you all that both my brothers who were really against me going to art school, both their sons went to art school later on. One has become an architect, another one just got into the same art school I went to. So things changed after a few years. And then um, my parents were actually born in India. Um, and at the time of partition 1947, they moved to Pakistan uh, with their parents as kids. Uh, so I remember growing up hearing a lot of stories of migration. I'm going to focus today on my series Searching for Home. So I'm going to tell you a little background how it all started. Um, when I was growing up, not just I was hearing the stories of migration from my parents and uh, elders of the family, but 
also um, seeing a lot of refugees around us. Until 2013, Pakistan was on top of the list for taking maximum number of refugees. Uh, I think Pakistan is still in top five, um, mostly from Afghanistan, but some from other neighboring countries as well. So I saw a lot of refugees growing up, trying to make their home again, struggling. And when I moved to US in 2008, I remember, um, I mean, although that was out of choice, but I could relate to certain things. For example, every time I went to Pakistan, someone, uh, friends here or people here would say, oh, you are going back home. So for them, probably my home was where I was born. Whereas after a while, I started feeling like this was my home too. So I, it started a conversation in my mind. Is home a place where you are born or is it a place where you feel you belong? And that's how um, this idea came into my mind to uh, create a series around the concept of searching for home. So I grew up in a society which was uh, very close uh, about certain many topics. I mean, we grew up hiding, um, you know, even undergarments, not talking about a lot of issues, including sex, puberty, even relationships, fertility issues. There were so many topics which were uh, considered taboo. And uh, I was always interested in, in, in these topics that why we are not talking about them. So that's what I feel that we are all made up of stories. Uh, the stories we tell others, the stories we tell ourselves, and most importantly, the stories we hide. And I was always interested in the stories that we hide and uh, consider, which are considered taboo. So uh, when um, I had this conversation with Well We Arts Museum, uh, about a solo show, they, uh, they we were having a conversation what I would like to do. And um, I was at that time uh, interested in the topic about home and migration and refugee crisis. And this was the first image that came to my mind, barbed wire fence. And around that time, I mean, in the first initial years of my career, I spent a lot of time learning about wood. So when I was in art school, I, um, uh, was interested in fine arts in general, and that's the department I got in. Um, and I was interested to learn all the basics. We had four different categories, miniature painting, painting, printmaking, and sculpture. And um, I remember I got a lot of warnings not to take sculpture as my major, because it's considered not just physically challenging, but um, in, in, a, in a living in Pakistan in a society which is Islamic, Islam came as a reaction to idol worshiping and um, a lot of people confused idols with 3D objects. Uh, so sculpture was, taking sculpture was an additional challenge in that society. So I got so many warnings that I said, okay, I have to see what's so tough about it. So I took it as a challenge and I took sculpture as my major. And I remember when I was in sculpture department, uh, Pakistan, uh, especially South Asia, is known for um, wood carving, mostly for furniture making purpose. Uh, uh, so I, uh, and also miniature painting, I was interested in miniature painting too, which was mostly used for book illustration purpose. So these were the two mediums which were really popular, uh, known, but in as a medium of craft. And I thought I could do something new with them. And when, even at that time, and when I started traveling, I noticed there was a lack of woman's voice in the medium of wood. It was very clearly, and it still is very clearly male dominated medium. So uh, I was always interested in women issues. So I said, what better medium than a male dominated medium? And after a few years, I became known for, you know, making a very hard looking, a solid looking uh, medium like wood into very soft uh, looking material. And I was pushing the boundaries and I was doing a lot of, you know, unusual uh, uh, symbols and objects and imagery. Um, I always feel objects are like people. They can tell you they come from, they can tell you stories. So this was something I wanted to do. And I uh, have been working, I've trained uh, someone who is actually a furniture maker uh, to help me with my bigger projects. And uh, he has seen me do very, uh, challenging works, but when I spoke to him about uh, this idea that I want to carve a barbed wire fence in wood, uh, I, for six months he did not even pay attention to me. Probably he thought that this is such a crazy idea. How is it even possible? But uh, he, after six months, I was so persistent. He said, "Okay, let's we can work on it." And 
it took me a year and a half to um, work on the details. I was doing a lot of studies, how I can make it. Uh, and then after a year and a half, I was able to um, figure out how, how I could make it. So each knot is actually in two pieces and each five inch section is actually cut straight, then steamed and bent in a mold to get this curve and then join together. And then each knot is in two pieces too. And so under every knot, there is a joint. So, but after uh, a year and a half, I had figured out how to make it. Then it was just the matter of labor. This is all I had after a year and a half, <laughs> but I had figured out how I could make it. So I started with about 400 feet long barbed fence, ended up with a little over 300 feet, which was just enough to create a 30 feet long barbed fence. So this is uh, at the time when I was installing barbed fence at Bellevue Arts Museum in 2017. And that's how it was installed. So um, I will show you another image just to show you the scale of work. Um, this is about seven feet high, 30, little over 30 feet uh, long. And this is uh, how you feel when you enter into the space. Uh, that you are outside the fence and when you go all the way inside you will feel you are inside the fence and so my this series is actually touring different museums so this one is reinstalled uh, in philadelphia at center for uh, art in wood and this is how it is installed there so uh, in 30 feet long bar bar fence so yes doing something very challenging that can surprise people is important for me but then i also have to have a purpose behind it or uh, a topic that I want to uh, open up and have, ask, I mean, my point of my work is to start a conversation. So when I was doing my research, um, I tried, I was interested in women issues, stories of women, and I was interested in topics like, okay, what if uh, women had a menstrual cycle when they uh, were moving from one place to another? What did they do to get by that time? And then when I was doing that research, I was also I wanted to learn more about um, all the issues faced by refugees, uh, especially women. And if you know, uh, rape and molestation is one of the biggest crimes of war and even uh, during the migration at refugee camps. So this was the topic I was interested in. So I actually carved one uh, underwear out of pine wood and it's hung at one point and it has red stain just to bring up all these issues. So the for me, just surprising my audience, doing something which is unimaginable is not enough only. I have to have a reason or a purpose behind the work. So this is just to show you details and the shadows that this installation was creating. So once you are inside the fence, what you see through is another installation. It's, it's called Fragments of Home Left Behind. There are five portraits that I painted. Uh, they are based, um, they, these are actually girls in uh, refugee camps between the ages of four and 11. So this is one of my uh, reference photographs. When I was doing my research, I saw a lot of images, places which were after the attack, people moved out and left the homes behind. There are bullet holes on the wall, some leftover items. And it became uh, my reference for this installation in which I painted five portraits, uh, girls which are in different camps in Syria, Pakistan, Jordan, and uh, Kenya also. This is how it is installed. So uh, this is uh, one of the portraits uh, and you can see there are bullet holes around it and there are ants crawling around it. So Lujan, uh, she is originally from Syria in a camp in Jordan. And when I saw her photograph, uh, she has a broken shoulder and it just reminded me of a dandelion plant, which, which is very fragile, but it's, it has strength too. This is something that I felt. I uh, intentionally chose the age group between four and 11 because I feel this is uh, an age when their expressions say it all. They do not, do not really understand what's going with them, what's happening around them but they have this determination and strength that no matter what they are going to get by this time. And this is exactly what I felt. Although she has a broken shoulder, but the strength on her face, you know, the feeling that no matter what I'm going to get by this time just reminds me of this, you know, uh, this amazing strength. 
and this is another uh, portrait uh, sana gulab uh, it's uh, she's originally from afghanistan but in a camp in pakistan islamabad and she is holding her doll and uh, i will also mention that all of this is painted so how miniature painting is done it's just developed dot by dot so the we make our own brushes pigments paints which is mostly gouache and also transparent uh, color and make our own paper which is uh, multiple layers of paper glued together because there are such transparent so many layers of paints uh, that it has to be a strong paper and each uh, and at the end of the brush which is made of uh, the hair from squirrel it's only one hair so each you can see actually each dot uh, or the whole painting is developed by dot by dot uh these are also this is also a portrait of siblings in a camp in kenya originally from somalia and that's how it is installed uh, with bullet holes around it and there are ants crawling around it uh, another portrait of mona originally from syria and she has bruises on her face so when i was doing my research one of the things that uh, stood out to me that these kids were mostly speaking about the that they had to leave their home they want to go back home their family or parents or father want them to go to uh, a country like us and find uh, a safer place make their home again but all they were thinking about is home that they left behind so she did not talk about how she got bruises on her face but she was just talking about going back to home so i i thought i will show you what is my uh, process when i'm doing a miniature painting i start with an out a sketch which is just an outline and start from background to foreground start adding colors little by little layers of colors adding slowly it's a slow process but that's how it's finished so it's another portrait of laiba originally from afghanistan and in pakistan so i've done a lot of my research uh, on in the camps in pakistan some of it uh, is in jordan and some of it um, in kenya and i have also done research in um, work with an organization here in seattle and i've uh, met with and interviewed uh, refugees who are now based in seattle as well so this is how this portrait is, these portraits are installed so about ants uh, this is another um they, these are small sculptures um i have them crawling around my around my work in the show so i started developing this idea many like i think about 2013 2014 2014 and i was interested uh, in the beginning to paint them for so for me i use a lot of symbols in my work and ants symbolize not just because we grew up and saw a lot of ants around us whenever we left something for dead and decay and uh, but they also represent a hard working nature that i can also relate to the because i feel i'm a hard working person and also they have a strong uh, female uh, model uh, the leader they are also known for migrating in groups which was related to my uh, theme of migration so each one is handmade uh it's made out of wire epoxy putty and paint and this tiny part that you see is actually a glass bead and then it's painted so each one is handmade uh there is another um work uh, in the, in the whole series it's a breast pump and when i was doing my research i was interested in women issues uh, often what i saw in available research was uh, stories told by the male member of the house and i felt uh, women and children do not get to tell their side of the story for example i had this question what if they are pregnant they are breastfeeding they have an infant child what did they do to get by that time when they are running away from one place or moving from one place to another um when i uh, i had multiple miscarriages um when i during my fourth pregnancy uh, which was then successful i have a daughter uh, she was 3 weeks old when my father passed away and i left her here with my husband and i only took my breast pump and i flew from us to pakistan um and i remember i have to take multiple flights and it at every i at every transit i had to go through extra security clearance because i was carrying a breast pump and i had i was asked why i don't have an infant i had to go through this extra layer of security which made my uh, experience that much more difficult 
So when I was doing my research, I was interested in these issues, what women are doing to get by that time. So I actually carved um, a breast pump. It's uh, carved out of pine wood. It's turning and carving both combined. And then there are ants crawling around it and um, some drops of blood. That's how it is installed in, in the show. There is another installation. It's called The World is Not Perfect. So I remember there was a time after a few years, I became very known uh, for, uh, you know, soft sculptures, fabric like turning wood, a solid like uh, medium into very soft fabric like. And I said, hmm, because I always like to take challenges. What else can I do? I said, OK, I'm going to go in exactly an opposite direction and um, make wood look even harder. And I was thinking about doing stone and brick. So I carved uh, these bricks out of mahogany wood. All the other objects are uh, carved out of pine wood for the contrast. And that's how it is installed. So this is my reference image. Uh, a mosque in Pakistan was attacked. And I often feel even when I was doing my research, uh, areas which are being attacked even after war, this is what's left behind. Um, a lot of shoes, some leftover items of the wounded and killed. And of course, broken buildings if it's a war or after an attack. So um, I have made a lot of shoes for this installation, some toys, some cell phones and different items carved out of pine wood and mahogany. These are all the shoes that I have in that installation. And um, some of them belong to my family members. These belong to my father, my mother. These are my shoes. And some I collected, borrowed, bought from secondhand shops. Some have stories behind it, for example, this, um, shape I really wanted it. it's worn mostly in the northern areas in Pakistan and I had to spend a lot of time finding this shape but all I was able to find was like new like uh, shoe and when I make my pieces I'm always interested in uh, objects which have a presence of a human so they I do not often buy new objects or uh, by reference material but I like to go to secondhand shops a lot and buy from them I was not able to find this shape and I was looking for it. Um, and I remember uh, I have actually some very funny stories how I gathered some of my reference materials. Uh, so one day I was in Pakistan and I was with my niece going uh, in a street uh, and it was raining at that time. There were small puddles of water and I suddenly saw this shoe left in, in one of the puddles. Um, and I remember I looked on my right and left, took out my bag because it was really in a bad shape. And I picked it up, I put it in a bag, brought home. I left uh, for it to dry in sun for many days. And then I used it as a reference shoe. So, I mean, there are many stories how I collected uh, different shoes, but these are the shoes which were made for this installation. And that these are, this is one of the detailed image just to show you the details and uh, how it is installed. This is another installation in the series. It's called The Stains Are Forever. Uh, maybe some of you know, in 2014, a school in Pakistan in Peshawar was attacked by Taliban and over 140 young kids were killed. So at that time, I remember it's one of uh, the experiences that when I saw images, I could not sleep for days. It affected me so deeply. Um, and I saw uh, bodies of young kids in pools of blood. And uh, at that time, uh, there was a war going on between Taliban and Pakistan army. So Pakistan army was targeting some of the uh, Taliban majority areas. And in that, uh, in some of the attacks, some of their kids got killed. So this was actually an attack back on Pakistan army, uh, like a more like a revenge that you killed our kids, we are going to kill your kids. And their target was mostly boys. So uh, over 140 young kids were killed. And I saw young bodies in pools of blood. And just after a day, Pakistan army announced, we are not defeated. We, don't, uh, we are not scared of you. We're going to open the school again. And I started looking at images of people washing floors of the school, which are covered with blood. And somehow those images spoke even louder to me. Like they are trying to wash the floors, the stains from the floors. And no matter how much they wash, are they really able to going to remove the stains from the history? 
And this uh, piece is actually inspired by that, not just that incident, but my feeling, how I felt at that time. So there are actually 39 pacifiers in the installation. I am, um, it's important for me, a number is important for me. So 39, because there are 39 weeks of pregnancy. So I often talk about experience or how a mother would feel. Like I, as a mother at that time, was feeling like, what if it was my child? And as you know, even in US, uh, kids, uh, some schools have been attacked and their kids have been killed. So I couldn't stop myself from thinking, what if it was my child? And it could have easily been. And so there are 39 pacifiers and then there are nine white butterflies painted to represent again, nine months of pregnancy. So um, this is my process. I thought I'll show you. So the pacifiers are carved out of pine wood, then they are stained. And I've painted the butterflies uh, on the black sheet. And this is how it is installed. So this is what I was trying to achieve through this installation, that white, butter, white butterflies, just like pure souls flying away from uh, the bodies which are covered with blood. And then there are ants crawling around them. So in the same in, in the same incident, all the over 140 kids were killed and only one girl was killed. It was her first day in school. She was five years old. And uh, I saw, I only saw image of her shoe, uh, which was uh, stained with blood. And at that time, my daughter was five years old too. And she had similar shoes like this. So I again could not stop thinking, uh, you know, about I as a mother and decided to actually carve my daughter's shoes, which were uh, similar to these shoes. Um, and then this is uh, how I carved and then painted and treated them. And this is how they are finished. And I photographed my own daughter and I uh, drew a cactus garden around her and I started painting. So you can see, uh, I make my own pigments, uh, my gouache I'm using pigments in shells because again, uh, just to avoid any chemical reaction and they are nat natural uh, palettes and I can reuse them so for many different purposes. So you can see I'm adding color little by little, adding details dot by dot and that's how I'm developing the painting and that's how it is finished. And this is how it is installed on a carved swing and with the shoes underneath it. So um, for me, it is important that I'm not just pushing the boundaries of medium, but I'm also pushing the boundaries of concepts and ideas as well. This is another installation in the show. It's called Searching for Home. And these are carved out of pine wood, uh, mostly suitcases. So in the beginning, when I was thinking about the concept of migration, moving from one place to another, this was the image that came to my mind, suitcases or bags, because people often carry one with them. And I was also interested to learn in the beginning, I thought, okay, I'm going to keep the bags closed because I don't know what people carry with them. But after I conducted many interviews, it became evident to me that, you know, it's no secret. So this is one of the smaller backpacks, uh, a kid's bag and their shoes, which are stained. So there are some blood stains in the installation as well. And um, I also, when I was conducting interviews and I was asking a lot of refugees or people who have migrated from one place to another, what did you bring along when you move from one place to another? And other than um, often a lot of people said just some, if we were able to bring something often, it's just everyday objects like some clothes, everyday things we need. And then almost everyone said, other than that, they try to bring one thing that either reminded them of their culture or uh, like photograph something that reminded them of their family or something which was special to them, like something which was passed on to them through their family. Um, so I saw a lot of Afghan refugees when they moved to Pakistan brought small rug with them. So I decided to carve one small rug and add into the installation. So after a while I realized it's no secret what they can bring with them. So I decided to open one suitcase and show what they are actually able to bring with them. And this is again another painting in the installation, uh, miniature painting. 
of uh, a girl, Lena, who is five. She is now based in Seattle. At that time, when I was working on this series, she was five years old. And again, my daughter was also around the same age. So I work with an organization called Riva, Refugee Women Alliance in Seattle. And uh, they helped me uh, meet many refugee families who have resettled in uh, Seattle area. And I remember meeting her mother, Asma, a very strong woman, and right away uh, having a connection with her. And not just because we had the same age daughter, she has two more sons, but because of her story too, uh, she's born in Zambia. And when she was very young, like she was in ninth or 10th grade, just um, 13, 14 years old, uh, she, uh, her family um, received a proposal for her, someone who was a diplomat posted in US. It was his second marriage. He wanted to marry her. He made promises to the family. He will let her study because she was interested in getting higher education. And uh, But after they got married, uh, she had to go through a lot of domestic abuse. Within three years, she has three kids and she was not able to go back to school. So she, because she, she was a strong woman, she was standing up for herself. And when her husband realized that she is not going to um, let everything happen the way it's happening, he took her passport, left her behind, took the kids, brought them with him to US. So uh, she, after a while she realized her passport was expiring. So she got it renewed, got US visa, came to US, with the help of that person's first wife, took her kids, ran from shelter to shelter for two years until she met this organization, Riva. And then they filed for the custody of kids. They got her transitional housing. She enrolled back into the school. And just a little while ago, she became a nurse and she's taking care of her kids now. So for me, it was important that I have a local story, a positive story into the series just to show people why it is important to support such programs, welcome refugees, they can become productive member of the society. So this is how it was painted. I, since the focus of my show was on girls and women, but I wanted to show respect of her story that she just did not come for her daughter, but her sons too. So I do have shadows of her sons painted in the background, but I kept my focus on her daughter, Laila. And this is how it is composed. So usually when I have an idea, I go to secondhand shops a lot. I gather, borrow uh, objects that I feel will go well within my um, installation. This is how I usually stage my idea before I start working in wood. And that's when I go buy my material and start working on the piece. So this is how it is finished. It's carved out of pine wood. Uh, these are actually individual pieces, but they are placed in a way that it looks like one piece. So um, after a while, I was looking at different images and I saw two, um, as you know, this issue has uh, even spread to different countries and increased. So I, I decided to add more pieces into the series. This is one of the newer pieces. It's a tied up plastic bag. And I saw image of two boys running away, which I will show you in a little bit um, in Myanmar. Uh, when their houses were burned and they were running away and they were just holding one tied up plastic bag. So you can imagine some people are only, that's what they are only taking with them when they are leaving their home behind and just running away in search of a new home. So I carved this out of pine wood again and then added into the installation. This is um, another of one of the new pieces. Again, most of the pieces are based on photographs of what's happening in Burma. And there is one which is based on uh, Gaza. Uh, this is a little close up. And I will show you one by one. This one, this piece is actually a rear view mirror because I feel um, this is actually carved out of pine wood and stained black. Um, I feel rear view mirror is like looking back what you are leaving behind and running away. So many villages were uh, burned. Uh, the, this is actually a combination of two photographs that I combined in one painting and many villages in Burma were burned and people were forced to move. Um, this is another again image um, often women were raped and molested and if they had a young child, um, I read a lot of uh, incidents when they were the young kids were killed thrown away in fire also and uh, in, in mud also. So this is one of the photographs that broke my heart and 
affected me very deeply and I decided to paint in one of the rear view images. So these are also to bring attention to this issue, why a lot of people are forced to move. It's not that they have a choice. Sometimes they have no other option but to run away for their life and move to a new place in search of a safer home. This is the photograph that I mentioned earlier, which I used to paint uh, this uh, piece. Uh, two boys who are running away with just one tied up plastic bag. So not just it's an inspiration for this uh, painting, but also the carved plastic bag for other installation. And also this is how water is painted in miniature painting with very fine lines uh, and mostly in Persian miniatures, but I uh, am mostly inspired by Persian school of miniature painting, Mughal, and there is one Indian Kangra school. So often, although when we get our training, we learn all the basics of miniature painting in a traditional way. But then once you learn the basics, then you are pushed to uh, find your own voice and your own style into the medium. So this is again, um, the uh, reference is a photograph of when a mosque is attacked in Gaza. Um, and I painted for one of the pieces. And this is another one I saw, um, portrait of a mother and daughter. It, it's one of the photographs that just affected me very deeply. And uh, I could see from their faces what they are going through. And uh, I the, in the background, this is an artistic interpretation because I was also looking at a lot of images in which people were burnt alive. So that's the background. And you can see what they are going through after uh, you know witnessing some of these incidents. So when I had, I had this show at Bellevue Arts Museum, at that time, C uh, Seattle uh, Channel was doing a documentary on my work in this on this series. And they asked me if I have some childhood photographs. While I was going through my childhood photographs, they, in, in my uh, album, in sandwiched in between uh, two photographs, I found a letter which was written to me by my brother. When I was very young, my father took him to England for treatment where he passed away. So before passing away, he wrote two letters to me. And when I found those letters, I had either forgotten about them or did not know I had them. It became very emotional to me. So I carved uh, an envelope and paired with his letter. And I remember when I posted about this work, a lot of people reached out to me, started sharing the letters they have. And um, I started hearing different stories, how it made many people to um, dig into yeah, their own collection of letters written to them by their loved ones. So I received so many that I decided to do actually a whole series and I carved multiple letters and paired them with different letters. I call it letters from home. They are written by people who, which are move, who are moved from one place to another, written by someone in a different place, different country. Some, one is as old as early 19, I think 1905. And as uh, new as just uh, a year ago, when a daughter reconnected with her father, she was adopted and she found her father and the first time reconnected with him and wrote a letter to him. So there are different letters. And this is what I feel. I feel I am a storyteller and I feel it is important that we share our experiences with other people and our stories will not just heal us, but also somebody else. And when you tell your story, you not just free yourself, but give other people permission to acknowledge their own story too. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so pleased to um, be able to hear this. There are some questions. I also have questions, but I'll start with other people's questions. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, the first one is all of your subject matter is sort of charged politically. Have you ever experienced negative confrontation from your audience or even government authority to the work you create? And if yes, what is your way to work with that? So, um, yes, I mean, growing up in Pakistan, I started my career as an artist. I actually established myself before moving to US. And I was painting nudes. I was doing a lot of uh, work based on controversial issues. And I got many warnings, but uh, yes, there was some uh, reaction, um, concern <laughs> from friends, but uh, I a lot of uh, response that I received was positive too. 
a lot of people thank me for bringing these issues up, giving people opportunity to discuss them. I think art has this advantage that it can bring people closer through the, through the beauty. That's why I spend a lot of time on the execution as well. I feel uh, a successful work of art is in which execution and concept are in balance. So if you spend that much more, more time creating the work, your audience spend that much more time looking at it, exploring the layers behind it. So, so yes, I mean, I do have an advantage as an artist that I can open up all these difficult conversations, but yes, I also have to be ready to face criticism, negative reaction as well, but I am inspired by the positive reaction more. I get my inspiration. I remember um, after I had multiple miscarriages and I was asking some of my friends who I knew personally have had miscarriages, um, because I just did not know what was happening to me. I was a little lost. I wanted to learn about other people's experiences and they were not openly discussing their uh, experiences with me. And I remember uh, once I asked a close friend um, that, why is it so? And she said, you know, uh, often women stop talking about it because they know if they tell people they have had a miscarriage, they end up getting the blame from the society that probably something is wrong with you. That's why it happened. And I had faced some of that too as well. So, uh, but I did not feel that was, that should have stopped people from discussing if they had a difficult con experience. And when I did a whole series, I decided to put all of that experience and created a whole series, which was called Red Series. And I, uh, all, most of the works were about motherhood, uh, loss, miscarriages, and some people who came to the show, some of them started crying and they started sharing their personal experiences with me. And that was the time where, although I have been working on these difficult topics, but that was the time I realized this is my calling. This is exactly what I want to do for the rest of my life. That art has this power to open people up, open difficult conversations. I think along with that, Mike, I have a question, which is like, you must be able to set up sort of barriers uh, between these stories and yourself, um, and then also kind of allow yourself to, to um, some, you know, to take care of yourself in a lot of ways so that these things don't necessarily get in. Is, I guess uh, my question is, have you found a good way of doing that throughout or is it important that that gets in? Well, um, there are times like I, when I was working on this series, I was in my studio, I had hundreds of portraits of uh, girls and women uh, in refugee camps and from their expressions, you can actually see what they are going through. Yeah. And I was surrounded by them. And I was working on this series for over two years. And I remember the curator came to my studio and she just started crying. She uh, broke down and she asked me, how am I able to do it? Mm -hmm. And so, yes, the difficult, uh, the topics are difficult. There are days when I'm sad without a reason. I sometimes see uh, these people struggling in my dreams. I sometimes see myself in their place in my dreams and it affects me. But then I have to tell myself that I have to find the strength to be able to work on them because some of the work takes months, sometimes years to finish. And I'm constantly working on them, constantly thinking about them. Mm -hmm. but, so they affect me deeply, yes. But then once they are finished and they are able to start these difficult conversations, sometimes move people, it gives me this feeling that I'm on a right path and what I'm doing is important at this time in, to raise these issues. I feel as an artist, it's our responsibility. I take it as a responsibility to educate society and talk about these topics, which otherwise are difficult for people to talk about. Yeah, yeah. I just wonder like how you go on vacation. Like, I just need to get away. <laughs> <You're not laughs> well, it happens. I mean, when I'm working, I'm intensely involved, but once I finish and I, uh, I yes, I take a small break. Uh, but then after taking a break, I, I really want to get, sometimes if I take a longer break, I start missing working. And I said, okay, I need to get back to work because I'm so passionate about my work that uh, the kind of feeling I get from creating, I do not get from anything else. Right. Yeah. So it's important for me to be in my studio and creating. Yeah, great. 
Okay, another one is being in the US for about 13 years, as, as you mentioned, what does home mean to you now? How do you identify yourself to the question of where are you from? Um, I feel home is where you feel you belong. It doesn't have to be a place where you are born. This is my personal feeling. I feel Pakistan is my home and US is my home too. I feel at home at both places. I think it, I have asked this question. We actually had a full conversation about the concept of home when I had the show at Balvi Arts Museum. And uh, I got different responses to this question. A lot of people say it's where it's about feeling often. Sometimes some people even said, I do not know where my home is still. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, I think the answer varies from person to person, how you personally feel. And ev every answer is fine. Yeah. I'm completely fine with even people saying, I do not know where my home is. I'm still in search of it. It's interesting. The, the question comes from an artist who uh, uh, comes from somewhere else and um, in the process of coming from that different place sort of changed, had to change who they were in some way. Um, so it, it just, it, the question sounds like a, sounds uh, run of the mill in some ways, but it is really weighted, I think, by who was actually asking it. And I'm, I'm sorry, we don't have her, you know, voice in it, so. Um, okay, another question is, can you say again what the meaning is of framing the miniature paintings inside the rear view mirrors? Yeah, so rear view mirrors, um, I started working on them initially there uh, in a series which is called Tempting Eye series. As you know, in Saudi Arabia, women couldn't drive for a long time. In 2018, they got permission to drive. And I, before they got permission to drive, I was already working on this concept uh, about the ban. And then I, around the same time, I read about a law in Saudi Arabia that often eyes are the only part they're able to show and the rest of their body is covered and they make their eyes really pretty. So they introduced a law, it's called tempting eyes law. If they make their eyes really pretty, they can be charged for that. And when I read about it, I said, how ridiculous it can be. <laughs> like, so I decided to paint, uh, you know, pretty eyes uh, in uh, carved rear view mirrors out of word. And I actually combined these two together. That's how it started. But when I was working on searching for home, I also felt rear view mirror is kind of a symbol as if you are running away, but looking back what you are leaving behind or what made you leave your home. It's also, you know, a way of like a window into your past or what you are leaving behind. So they worked really well as a frame or as a, you know, as an element into my installation. Lovely. Yeah, and I watched um, earlier, I watched you driving in 2018 in Saudi yeah. Arabia. Yeah, so I actually, uh, I flew to you, uh, Saudi Arabia. That was the first year women got permission to drive. And I drove a car that a friend activist was arrested driving, the very same car. Uh, and even though they got permission to drive, a lot of women activists were still behind bars. So for a ride they fought for years, they couldn't practice at that time. So, so I felt the need to drive on their behalf who are not able to practice, which is, a, I, in my opinion, is a very basic right. right. So I went to Saudi Arabia, I drove that car <laughs> and well, I, I dosed it, it myself. <laughs> yeah, it's a lovely little movie, right? Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it's just like making my piece come to life, you know, yeah. something that I was painting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what are you working on now? What's your next, what's the next thing or are you resting? No, so I, as you know, I had a, another solo show at Greco Sarah Gallery just a few months back, which is called Sacred Games. Again, uh, issues and topics which are dear to me, uh, religious and political manipulation, how politics and religious people manipulate um, weak and vulnerable uh, for their own benefit. Um, and again, the focus is on women and girls, how they are suffering in society, um, different uh, regulations or restrictions which are mainly imposed on women and girls. Um, and I, my show Searching for Home is now on view in Pittsburgh at a Contemporary Craft. So I installed that. Um, that show is now touring. 
Um, I'm also working on a new series now. So, so yes, I mean, my work takes a long time. Often they are in progress for months to years. So I am already working on pieces that I might show in a year or two. Wow, really great. There is a response from Karen. Um, thank you for telling us about the Pretty Eyes series and what um, you were responding to in creating those paintings in the rear view mirrors. I'm glad I asked the question to hear about this. In my Women in, in a Global Context course, we talked about the driving demonstrations in Saudi Arabia as an example of Arab women's resistance. Mm -hmm. This is, <laughs> yeah. So just a nice comment about that. Okay. Um, I, you know, it, this has just gotten me thinking and I hope that it really gets a lot of other people just kind of thinking about this. I thought it was really amazing because you know, you said the sight of blood makes me faint and then you have blood in everything. So yeah. there's, a little, there's a little poke in each of those images or, or each of your installations in some ways. Yeah, I mean, um, in this world at this time where there is so much bloodshed around us, uh, we just cannot avoid it. And maybe I'm confronting my own fears, um, but also highlighting these issues which are very much happening at this time in around us in the world. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work. And thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure sharing my work. And um, thank you for listening to me. <laughs>